Hi, um, my name's Nick Bullfield and I'm a paediatrician and my wife and I have been working in Kyrgyzstan since 2013. And as it's turned out, we've um, engaged in the area of paediatric disability. Um, so many others have are involved in this work and I have over my time there been involved with UNICEF, with the German aid group GIZ, a little with the World Bank and with a number of other NGOs who are also doing work in this area. And also with the Minister of Health, uh, the Ministry of Health and particularly with the country's head pediatric neurologist, Dr. Babajanov, who has been very supportive of the work we're doing, even if he was a bit slow to come on board. So Kyrgyzstan is one of the ex-Soviet republics. It became independent in 1991. It has a population now of around six and a half million, most of whom are ethnic Kyrgyz, but about 30% uh, about of this population are under 14 or 14 and under. So that equates to around about 2 million children. There are quite a lot of other population group, including a lot of people who are ethnic Uzbeks, particularly in the South. There's about 10% of people who are Russian. And although many Russians left <clears throat> when the Soviet um, Union broke down, there are still many Russians in the country. And then there are a whole lot of minority, minority groups, including Dungans and Uyghurs from China, people from Tajikistan, um, some Koreans, Tatars, and Balkarians who all found their way to Central Asia in the 1930s when Stalin moved them to this part of the world. So it's a relatively small country, about 1,600 kilometers east-west and about 800 kilometers north-south. Um, and it, its two major borders are with Kazakhstan and with China. It's a very mountainous country. Um, and the Tian Shan mountain range dominates the whole country, um, which and Tian Shan means reaching to the mountains. Now, um, I just wanted to point out some of the places that I'll be talking about. This is where we actually live in Karakol. And the hospital I work at is um, about 20 k's from Karakol up a valley, which has naturally occurring hot water. And the hospital was built in the 1950s when they had an outbreak of polio. So I'm near, near Lake Isakul, which is the second largest um, alpine lake in the world. I'll be talking about Narun here, which is the neighboring province. The capital is Bishkek, um, and we've done clinics at Talas and Jalalabad, Nosh, and a place near Rosh called Norkat. So I'll be mentioning a few of these places as we go. So it's a very pretty country. This is the Russian Orthodox Cathedral in the town that I live, which was built about 110 years ago. There are a lot of mountains, and this is a scenic area near us called Jeti Orgas, and these hills here are known as the Seven Bulls. And this is one of the valleys further up uh, in Jeti Orgas, and this is covered with snow in winter, but a lot of people go hiking in this area in the summertime. Um, they're very keen dancers, and they have lots of celebrations through the year with lots of dancing. Um, we have wild camels to the western end of the lake. And on one occasion, we had to stop when we're going that way because they were just lying all over the road. This is near where we live. This is a place called Preston at the eastern end of Lake Hissacol. Um, and a famous explorer, Pervozhelsky, used to live here in the mid 1800s. In fact, he was buried here, but he was a Russian explorer in the Russian army. <clears throat> and he walked all the way to Peking from here. It's a very agricultural country, and most people live pretty much on subsistence farming. Um, and they have to gather hay during the summer when their cows, horses, and sheep are up in the mountains in the pastures there, they call gyros. But it's kind of comical at times when you see some of these vehicles that occupy just about the whole road. Um, traditionally, people used to be nomadic and live in these yurts, and this is in fact a community-based tourism yurt camp that we've stayed at a couple of times, which is not far from us. In the winter time, we have snow from November through to April, and this is a view looking north from the local ski field, and those mountains in the distance are part of Kazakhstan. 
So, as far as disability goes, <clears throat> in Australia, the incidence of cerebral palsy is about 2.5 per 1,000 live births. And some of the best data <clears throat> on CP comes from Western Australia, where it's been shown that about 93% are due to events occurring prior to the onset of labour, with a relatively small percentage occurring due to birth-related and other postnatal events. In Central Asia, <clears throat> officially, it is 2.6 per thousand live births. But the data we've collected over about five years really shows that this is not the case. And our best estimates put it at about 1.2% or maybe even up to 1.5%, which is about four times the official figure. As time's gone on and with data we've collected, we have shown that at least 30% are due to severe neonatal jaundice. And this condition is known as connectorous, and it's entirely preventable by the effective management of neonatal jaundice. We really don't have a clear idea about the portion that are due to birth asphyxia and other events, but our guess is that probably uh, as distinct from the world, Western world, um, that probably about 90% of cerebral palsy is due to events that occur after the onset of labour. So, there is a lot of shame associated with it. <clears throat> um, divorce is common for mothers of disabled children as they are to, uh, considered to be to blame for the child's disability. And it increases the poverty of families and within, and within the communities. So, um, so the data we've collected has been influential in bringing about quite significant changes where we are. Now, cerebral palsy gets categorized into a number of types, the spastic ones, the dyskinetic, ataxic, and hypotonic. But the group <clears throat> I want to focus on mostly is the dyskinetic group. In our first set of data of 216 patients, we found that about 63% of them um, had spastic cerebral palsy, but 38.8% of them had a dyskinetic cerebral palsy. Um, so it was a very large portion. And in this country, you might have 0.6 or 0.7% of cerebral palsy being of this time. So it makes a huge portion. When we collected history from the <clears throat> carers of the children with dyskinetic CP, at least half gave a, <coughs> excuse me, gave a clear history of severe neonatal jaundice. The figure's probably higher because many of the children we saw were brought in by grandmothers or aunts or uncles or siblings. And many of them did not know whether the, the children had had severe neonatal jaundice or not. But in our group, at least half had a clear history. What we also discovered from other data is that about 5% of the population have blood groups that are rhesus negative. Um, in the West, in Caucasian-based uh, European countries like our own, um, we have Caucasian population, the incidence is around 15%. So it's a relatively small group. And the anti-D that is effectively part of our um, management of mothers who are rhesus negative has been in place for about 50 years. And this has stopped the problem of what is known as rhesus isoimmunization. So what we understand is the giving of anti-D to mothers who are rhesus negative was part of the practice in Soviet times, but it sort of got lost after the Soviets left because when they left, they estimate that about 90% of the economy left with them. So in the work we're doing, our, our work is sort of fitted into four main areas. The clinical consulting work, which overlaps with teaching and training. We've established the Australian Cerebral Palsy Database and we now have that on computer and we're hoping that'll become web-based soon. And we've got data on about 1,600 children. As a result of the presentation of some of the data that we have gathered, um, I've been invited and have assisted in a number of health department guideline developments. And we've also been trying to work on this whole issue of how to reduce poverty and bring about change. So one of the things about reducing poverty has been to avoid useless treatments. Um, the medical training system in Kyrgyzstan 
is very similar to that in Russia, and it's very didactic. So problem-based learning is not part of their way of life. And when we started seeing these children, we kept hearing about the children having all of these different medicines, and we had no idea what they were. And eventually, we worked out that many of them were low molecular weight neuroproteins, which had been extracted from either pigs or cattle, and and were given intramuscularly once a month at significant cost to the families on the basis that they would help repair the brains. Needless to say, there was no evidence for this. And gradually over time, we've been able to convince most people to stop using it altogether. And in fact, the country's head pediatric neurologist has now um, given lectures to say that we should not be using this anymore. But parents of children with who are disabled are often lured to China for special treatments and also to Uzbekistan and to clinics which base, where they basically pay lots of money for, for treatments which do not lead to improvement um, and in some cases actually cause harm. The other thing is that cytomegalovirus, um, which most of us have at some stage early in our life, is often considered to be the cause of disability when there's no evidence for this. And while there are no treatments that work, um, these people often get offered bogus treatments. So that's been some of the ways in which we've been trying to reduce um, poverty issues um, in the children with disability and, and improve the outcome for their parents. And I, I think when we first went, probably 90% of the children we saw were on these various medicines. And I think now we'd say that's probably only about 10%. So we've done outreach clinics at a number of the places across the country. We've been seeing children with disability and we've learned a lot from this and probably we've seen over 500 children in these clinics. Tawas to the West is one of the smallest of their provinces and there are virtually no services, but it's a six or eight hour drive to Bishkek if they want to get any help. What we found in two places in the South Jalabad, Jalalabad and Kochkortar is that the staff there are basically embedded in the old ways, continuing to use useless treatments. And they really weren't interested in us teaching them new ways. Now, Rin, what we learned there was that <clears throat> when we gave a lecture on neonatal jaundice was that they had one phototherapy light for three and a half thousand deliveries. Um, and uh, the doctors had to make decisions about who got treatment when they had a number of children at the same time who were jaundiced. Two of the highlight of places that have been highlights to visit include Osh and Norcutt in the south. Norcutt is a place of over 100,000. Um, and when we stayed there, we were the first Europeans ever to stay at the accommodation we stayed at. But they have about 10,000 deliveries a year. And these places are keen to learn and keen to put in place um, practices that will reduce the number of kids who are disabled and improve outcomes. So these have actually been very rewarding places to visit. And we're due to do clinics in Osh and Norcutt probably in September this year. So these are some of the chairs we've made for children with disabilities. These are ones that I made one day. Um, and you see the slots in them. And these are very important for the children with dyskinetic CP because you can secure their pelvis. And then with support, you can get them sitting at tables like the one here, and that often helps them develop eye-hand coordination and improve their basic abilities to function. So primary prevention is the identification of a cause and effect relationships and strategically developing process and policies to prevent these problems. And that's what we've been in. So as far as the rhesus isoimmunization is concerned, um, we worked out that given the percentage, there are about 6,000 deliveries a year affected by potential rhesus isoimmunization across the country. And NTD costs about $100 Australian, um, and it would only take about five months of disability pension to pay for this. And some of the local people who have come on board and understand this problem have been lobbying the government to, to provide NTD for the mothers who need it free of charge because of its cost effectiveness. In 2017, we rewrote the, the national NTD policy and that was implemented in July, 2017. This doesn't mean that all the mothers who are rhesus negative can get hold of NTD, but 
we have seen increasing numbers of women now who have had anti-D um, and so the word is spreading and people are getting access to it even if they do have to find the money to pay for it. So what we found after um, looking at our data and presenting it at a national level um, that people were keen to start looking at how they could improve um, the management of jaundice and phototherapy units are a key part of the management of babies who are jaundiced in the neonatal period. Um, along with this, in the last year and a half, there's been a primary um, care early intervention program. And what we found with this is that um, the primary care providers and local doctors are picking up these children at an early stage and getting them referred for treatment. We're also identifying babies with dislocated hips at an early age and getting them involved in treatment. So the work has been the training and uh, we'll continue to do that <clears throat> this year and ongoing. And our aim is to make um, enough phototherapy units for the whole country. Um, at the moment, we have sufficient funds to make about another 60 units from another grant. Um, but the other part of it is we have what's called an irradiance meter, and this can measure the effectiveness of units. So here are some of the units we've made. So we made these, the first ones, after we visited Narin, and we realised that they cost about $1,000 US to buy, and so my translator and I took the irradiance meter to the local light shop, and we turned on all of the LED lights one by one and picked some of the lights which gave the highest irradiance meter, uh, measurements <clears throat> then we made our first set, which had five lamps, and subsequently we proved it. We're probably up to our Mark IV, Mark V. One which has eight spotlights and is by far the most powerful and very suitable to go on top of incubators. And the other, more like this one here on the top left, which is the same one here um, on the bottom left, these ones are very effective and are in fact big enough to, to have two babies under them. The other thing we discovered <clears throat> was we had this question that we were seeing babies who had connectors who were very disabled. And when we spoke to the mothers, they said, oh, they, they had phototherapy for, um, you know, for a week. And we thought, well, this doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense now because in the province that we're in, the Issaquah province, we checked every phototherapy light that was in existence. And we found only two in the main hospital that worked and that's not included in this chart. But we went around, these are some of the smaller hospitals, and basically they are either non-functioning, although their level of radiance was so low as to be ineffective. And it's considered that you have to have a measure of at least 10 to be effective. Um, and in fact, there are only two out of 16 in the whole province that we were working. So these other ones were older ones, and they were probably using old um, fluoro, tubes. Um, they couldn't buy replacements, um, but they had stopped giving the effect of irradiance. So just to go over a bit of the, <clears throat> the information about phototherapy units, it's the blue-green light spectrum that's needed, and some LED lights produce this very well. It needs to be above 10 microwatts per square centimetre per nanometre to be effective, and we follow international guidelines for their use in treating neonatal jaundice according to weight, prematurity, and other factors. Um, they're effective in pretty much all, this, all forms of jaundice except the most severe forms, and those are the ones caused usually by rhesus isoimmunization. Hence why we need to, to really address the um, anti-D for the mothers who are rhesus negative as well as manage and build these phototherapy units. And our best estimates would suggest that if we can get effective uh, management of neonatal jaundice across the whole country, we will probably have at least 650 fewer children disabled per year by connectorus. Um, and so that's what we're working on. So the two types of phototherapy lights we're making are highly effective. The, the ones with the five long tubes give us measures of 30, um, 30 microwatts per square centimetre per nanometre at 40 centimetres, and this increases to 40 units at 30 centimetres. And they're cold lights, 
and they work very well. In fact, the nurses in the local hospital who, who did the initial trials for us, they said that their old lights, the two that were effective, used to take about two days to reduce the jaundice in most babies. And they found that these ones, most babies, um, the jaundice is uh, effectively managed within 24 hours. They are fairly robust lights. Um, we've improved our design a bit over time. Um, and the good thing about LED lights is that they will continue to emit the same wavelength until they stop working. And our estimates, given what they have on these lights, that they probably can give 50,000 hours of, of useful light, is that they'll probably have between a five and 10 year life. The other good thing is that we bought all of these lights locally. So as long as they continue to be supplied locally, um, any of the lights where the bulbs go, they can be replaced. So Caracol, where we are now, has seven units in the maternity hospital and three in the main hospital. Um, they have about three and a half thousand deliveries in the hospital and another 2,000 deliveries around the province. And they now have 29 units, which I made last year during the COVID shutdown. <clears throat> and they've been distributed. <clears throat> now, in province, which had only one unit, now has 21 units. And they have 3,500 deliveries at their main hospital. And then they have a range of other hospitals that have um, smaller numbers of deliveries. So we've actually got two of the smaller provinces in the country. And I'm guessing probably around about 10, uh, probably a bit less than 10% of all deliveries that occur between these two provinces are now covered with adequate phototherapy lights. So we've, during our time, we've been able to access money from both the New Zealand and Australian embassies in Moscow. And our most recent one is that we have 10,600 US dollars from the New Zealand embassy in Moscow for phototherapy equipment. And we use that this year to make at least 160, about 60 units, I think. Now we can make them for about 8% or 10% of the cost of commercial ones. The commercial ones cost about between 1,000 and 3,750 US dollars. And we are making them for under $150. But um, when we have to deliver them, we, we think it'll probably cost us about $30 to deliver each of them because they're quite big and bulky. Um, and, you know, we have to basically hire a vehicle for a few days to take them. They're easily repairable, but they are very effective and we've had really very good feedback. So our aim this year will be, we need to test all of the units in the other provinces when we go there. And we'll probably do the next province nearest to us, which is the Chui province, which has the um, capital. I'm guessing that they probably have um, about 30, thousand deliveries there a year in that whole province um, and keeping the ones that are effective um, and then replacing or, or, or giving them adequate numbers and our best estimates are probably they need about one for every 500 live births and that's more or less what we're working on so over the rest of the country we're anticipating we probably need to make between about 200 and 250 more units um, so we also need to supply them to some of the general paediatric wards in the hospitals because babies that are older than a month of age are not supposed to be readmitted to maternity hospitals. Um, and there are three in the Caracol Hospital and we note that um, they've been used frequently to manage neonatal jaundice in babies that are over one month of age. So this has been quite an effective project and um, while it's run primarily by those of us in the NGO we're with, um, there has been assistance, particularly in spreading the word about the need and also assisting in trying to get appropriate training done for the staff so that they can use them well. So that's, that's our project. And we're very grateful to be able to share and to have the support of HealthServe um, in um, helping us to develop this further over this year and 2022.